there dr ankur kakkar will hold a dialogue with professor cg datta on the history of education and education policy uh, with a focus on humanities education i request the panelists to please come to the stage thank you namaskar thank you so much uh, dr kakkar for this eminently edifying lecture presentation uh, you did not only take us through a journey through time uh, showing us the various educational practices and uh, rooted traditions that we had in the field of uh, education dissemination of knowledge production of it in our country in an ancient era but i would say you have also uh, journeyed us through different civilizational outlooks on knowledge so that was very very useful and uh, probably to take this forward and uh, uh, because uh, you are a historian yourself um, i would take the liberty of starting our conversation on education history of education and education policy at the current point rather than talking about the past and i think it's not too unfair to do that because our studies of the past and you, you will be able to tell us better about it uh, the studies of the past have a very important bearing on our present uh, showing that the past and the present and the future are not really very different from each other but they are in a flux in a continuity so i would like to start this discussion by asking you about the state of humanities education social sciences also to a bit uh, that we are currently not just in india but because you uh, also had your training your uh, masters as well as doctoral training in europe so if you would like to talk about the state of humanities education uh, in india but also uh, at large in the world where are we standing currently thank you shrijit for this wonderful question and for thanks for uh, your warm words of appreciation for my lecture <clears throat> so when it comes to the situation of humanities at present in india let me highlight some challenges Uh, and some uh, basic problems that we are facing in this uh, field of social sciences in general if you compare it with natural sciences for example so what happens is na in natural sciences is that you have a field of research and experimentation and scientific inquiry and then you have some universal laws and then you have you conduct those experiments and you perform those results and you get the outcomes and also in natural sciences those outcomes have a direct bearing on the social aspects also in the sense that for example if a scientist is doing research on finding a cure for zika virus then they will conduct the experiment and they will undertake their research and they'll come up with their conclusion that will uh, be beneficial for society or harmful or whatever impact it will have on society it will have a direct impact on the society in many cases now we have found cures for cancer for example we have um, we are we have developed a vaccine for covid 19 which is a result of scientific research the problem with humanities research at the moment is that we are not able to come up with solutions for ground reality problems unlike the sciences in the sciences we are able to develop vaccines we are able to find cures for different viruses for example we are able to uh, we are making great advances in biotechnology in nanotechnology and uh, in semiconductors research which is directly impacting the way we live it is impacting our lifestyles the use of all these technical things is a result of that scientific research but humanities research at this time at in the current situation is not having that impact so for example the problems that humanities research is entrusted with let's say it is entrusted with the problem of solving ethnic conflict 
religious conflict, the sort of problem of uh, population control, the problem of um, environmental issues. We do not see any solution that is offered by any humanities person that is directly impacting these areas and helping us. The reason for that is, which I believe is one of the fundamental reasons, that humanities research is not so much grounded in terms of in the, with the ground reality and also it is not so much grounded in the latest findings from science. So, because it has isolated itself from the scientific findings and also from the ground reality, they are not able to propose any solution for the current problems. So, the future of sciences, of social sciences is bright only if they choose to align or rather root themselves in the natural sciences also and in the with the ground reality in general and this is also with science they also have to cover i mean they are doing this they are also uh, covering many aspects that were earlier related only to social science um, so for example if you want to let's say if we have to develop a policy uh, for environment if our lawmakers have to come up with a new environmental policy and do you think they will only consult the humanities persons? They will also consult scientists. Because this issue of environment policy is an issue of ethics also. It is also an issue related to biology. It is also an issue which in which we will have to take the social sciences into consideration. So, the as things stand today, the humanities disciplines and the departments of humanities in most of the colleges are not aware of this interdisciplinary approach to problems. They are not aware that most of the issues that confront us today are multidimensional in nature. And any isolated single approach will not solve any purpose. Another problem with humanities departments right now is that they use so much jargon and they use the, the phraseology is so restricted only to their discipline that people outside their discipline cannot understand that. They, whether it is because of some loyalty to a certain uh, uh, faction or maybe ideologically driven could also be the reason. But the fact is that unless there is a dialogue across a large section of society with humanities disciplines or departments, there cannot be any solution. So, uh, you can write endless amount of research papers on caste conflict or ethnic conflict, but it doesn't help matters on the ground. And if it doesn't solve matters on the ground, then the resources that are being spent for humanities research are waste. So, humanities departments at the moment have many challenges. They have to ground themselves in ground reality. They have to be uh, aligned with natural sciences, with latest findings in natural sciences. They have to do away with this limited phraseology, which is only understandable by a select clique of social scientists. So I think these are some of the problems that social sciences and humanities are currently facing. And all these things can be done away with. I mean, if we deal with that in the right manner. So, uh, thank you for that. Uh, in what you said, I hear two strands of ideas. One where you are uh, leading us to show a kind of break between uh, a possible dialogue that might have existed in some distant past between the humanities and liberal arts approach to education and uh, science and scientific methodologies based education, mainly the STEM subjects, um, science, technology, engineering and mathematics. So this break between you know, STEM subjects and uh, humanities and social sciences on one hand, and another problem which is perhaps more inherent to the humanities and social sciences is the problem of phraseology, the problem of uh, being too jargon driven. Uh, 
Um, these are two things. But I would like to first talk about the first problem uh, that you have indicated. Uh, where do you think uh, this sort of a break or a uh, rupture happened? Uh, at what point in time? Um, I see that as mainly a problem in the European university-based education system. Uh, but we used to have a time in Europe uh, where we have seen great educational institutions in ancient Greece and Rome, uh, starting from the Lyceum of uh, Aristotle uh, and uh, the gymnasium where Plato uh, used to hold his great dialogues. There we had a more unified and Catholic approach to all streams of knowledge. From there, we also have a very glorious tradition of the medieval scholastic uh, European, mainly uh, based in the church funded universities, where also we saw a very unified approach to different streams of knowledge. Uh, where do you see this break happened that we have come here today, not just in this country, which is bearing mostly a colonial legacy, but also at the center where this sort of approach originated? Where did this break happen? Thank you, Srijit. Uh, this is a very uh, interesting question and also it is uh, rooted in the historical evolution of the Western disciplines. So. Uh, in the medieval time, uh, one of the problems with the church funded universities was that and also with, because it was theologically a problem was that uh, they had to justify the sustenance of both uh, faith based studies and logic based studies. And uh, St. Thomas, Thomas Aquinas, for example, uh, uh, had this, uh, he, he made this two segregation <clears throat> between the uh, world of reason and the world of philosophy. And uh, theologically, St. Thomas Aquinas and many others uh, were, were had, had to reconcile belief and reason because belief was something that was theologically given to them and that could not be questioned and reason was something that they could question and they could inquire. So uh, with that starting point, I would say that there was a division in the Western mind. Then the division in the terms of in the departments and disciplines later on, uh, this came after the enlightenment. So in the enlightenment, reason was given importance over faith and most of the enlightenment or post enlightenment thinkers made this division between this uh, mind and matter and the, this, this uh, realm of the uh, rational self and the realm of the speculative and the realm of the uh, philosophical self and anything which was worthy of inquiry or worthy of being called discipline had to adhere to a rational framework. So the parameters that were set were according to the objective scientific inquiry parameters. So anything that any subject worth studying would be considered respectable if it adhered to these parameters after the enlightenment. So after Francis Bacon uh, used his uh, objective inquiry method and then we have other scientists doing the same. This led to a separation between what is true science and objective science, anything which is empirically verifiable, anything you can test verifiably uh, empirically that is true and that is science and other things are all speculative. This had, uh, I mean, because of this, there was separation between disciplines and in fact, uh, even in the social sciences disciplines, this um, endeavor to prove themselves to be scientific also started you know, from that time. So all social sciences from sociology to uh, history and to uh, uh, economics, they started developing methods to prove that they were scientific 
in the sense that they were uh, they, they could use empirically verifiable data and all. Uh, this was, I think, the root of the problem in the in the West. Uh, but recent research and recent findings have shown that you cannot separate the disciplines. What was so? What happened is earlier because of this separation, there were certain areas that only scientists could pursue and certain areas that only the philosophers could pursue. For example, if you wanted to study uh, ethics or behavior, then that was the domain of the philosophers and of the, let's say, social scientists. Uh, but if you wanted to study uh, matter and if you wanted to study nature and you wanted to study the universe and all that, or the human body, that would be the domain of the scientists. But recent research has shown that this division is no longer valid because Recently, many works of scientists have been published that talk about those aspects which were not considered scientific earlier. So, for example, you have works of neuroscientists on ethics, on behavior, on, uh, on even on, on social issues. So now this division, at least in the West, is slowly getting blurred and people are beginning to realize that any subject will have to be any subject has different dimensions and uh, you cannot approach any subject if you want to go into the depth without a knowledge of uh, both science and uh, a grounding also in the humanities and social sciences. Thanks for that. And uh, from what you said, it brings to my mind uh, the case of uh, the field of consciousness studies, uh, I think, which is a very prominent example in the kind of uh, interdisciplinary approach to uh, knowledge production as well as, you know, training people, young scientists as well as young uh, philosophers, because it uh, this particular field, consciousness studies, stands at the intersection of uh, different fields, as you mentioned, uh, neurosciences, uh, then I think there are quite a few good philosophers who are working, David Chalmers name comes to my mind, then there are physicists who are all converging on uh, this particular approach to reading the human mind and redefining uh, the very concept of consciousness. So uh, I see uh, what you're trying to uh, point here and I think uh, it's very clear that this movement towards um, uh, you know an unification of approaches has already started uh, maybe in pockets in Europe uh, or the West at large uh, but coming back to our uh, discussion with re with respect to uh, where we stand in India uh, so far as humanities and social sciences or let's say generally a liberal arts based education is concerned, where are we uh, in this whole picture? Can you give us uh, some ideas on that? You mean humanities in India? That's right. Okay. So uh, if you look at most of the humanities departments in India, they are still mostly uh, designed along the conventional lines that uh, were formulated in the modern time in the when uh, after the British came and then designed the university system. So you still have humanities departments in India that are traditional and in the sense conventional departments like a department of history or department of sociology, department of economics. And uh, there still exist silos and these, uh, uh, these departments function in silos. In fact, in the fact that you will hardly see a person from a geography department working in uh, in a history department and you will rarely see students who are studying in both departments it is in fact discouraged if you are a geography student you can't study you can't take a course in history which i find to be quite uh, ridiculous because you cannot study history without geography and you can't study geography without history so we still in India don't have this, at least in the mainstream academic uh, framework, I'm saying, uh, we still are yet to implement this idea that any study is a study 
ranging across disciplines whether it is a historical inquiry or it is a inquiry of uh, into the anthropology of of a certain people any study will be, will be a study ranging across disciplines and um, this was very famously also said uh, by uh, jr diamond in his book guns germs and steel in which he studies the origins of societies and he says that history is not a field isolated in itself it is to be studied in collaboration with various disciplines it is biology and uh, genetics and you have anthropology so the problem in india is that we are still stuck to this conventional idea that disciplines are separate and segregated and that's why we still have separate departments where students from one department cannot take up a course in any other department a big and whereas the interesting part is that they are asked to do interdisciplinary study they are when they are asked to take up projects or they are asked to write their uh, thesis then typically towards the end of their uh, yeah. curriculum right so they are trained in a discipline but they are expected to write reports on interdisciplinary approach. so a mismatch between training and expectations yes yes that's interesting and uh, i also think what is quite interesting in how you identified the area where all these disciplines and approaches are operating currently in silos uh, you called it uh, the mainstream education and maybe you, um, uh, i would uh, uh, request you to define uh, what you mean by mainstream but my guess is that you are uh, largely talking about the public institutions in india because in india when we talk about uh, good universities uh, the f- few names that come to our mind uh, immediately Uh, are basically the universities uh, uh, like the JNU or the Delhi University um, Jamia Millia or you know the uh, institutions uh, like uh, IITs uh, where uh, cutting edge research uh, is currently being worked upon uh, both in technology sciences uh, as well as in the humanities uh, there are some very good departments uh, that we know of so uh, by mainstream do you mainly indicate towards uh, the public funded uh, the government funded institutions in india uh, because uh, uh, maybe i would uh, like to draw your attention to the role that the private universities are currently playing for example uh, there are universities in the vicinity of the delhi ncr region uh, which have started offering courses in liberal arts where there is some sort of an unification of approach uh, emerging uh, for example in uh, our university in rishihood we are going to offer from the next academic year uh, an ma program a masters program in interdisciplinary humanities and research what we are calling it so uh, i would need you to define that mainstream and whether that uh, nature of the mainstream uh, is perhaps changing in india i would like your comments in that thank you thank you yes uh, you correctly guessed by mainstream i mean most of the public institutions and uh, that are recognized by the government and also mostly funded by government uh, that have adhered to the uh, ugc framework uh, yes i agree, and i am glad to know and i am aware that there are many private institutions that have now started launching programs that are interdisciplinary now the problem with uh, launching some of these departments in uh, uh, various universities especially i'll talk about the public institutions first uh, so ugc recently recommended that there should be a humanities department in every technical uh, institution whether it is iit or any other institution the problem with that was that when it got implemented the humanities departments in these institutions became silos in themselves and the scientific uh, or the in the technological departments were functioning as they were originally so we did not really see a collaboration rather we saw a different department being set up within an institution 
that was not the objective of interdisciplinary study the objective of interdisciplinary study was to conduct a study which involves experts and involves expertise of different disciplines within that study for example if you want to uh, let's say conduct a research into the uh, uh, let's say you want to study the uh, the way that the the family system in india has been changing suppose you want to study that now typically you will have that you will have a, some social scientist will get some data and get some trends and all that but because of the multi dimensional nature of the subject it is important to have people from the field of uh, biology and genetics to also study this so the pro the point i am trying to say is that when we talk about multidisciplinary study we are not talking about that there should be separate departments within a university who are doing their own work the work should be done collectively by the departments that is something which is still missing at least in the in the government mainstream institutions and uh, uh yes some private institutions as you said have launched programs that are interdisciplinary in nature uh, what i envision and especially looking at the education policy the latest one is that there will be more such programs that will have subjects ranging from across disciplines so you will have a bachelor's degree in uh, let's say leadership as you were saying uh, but the subjects will be taken up you know from both sciences and humanities so maybe somebody will be maybe you'll have a, a course in history you'll have a course in in uh, classics you will have a course in in mathematics also you will have a course in uh, physics also okay so this we will see happening more and more in the future and we will also see and at least i hope that we see students from a particular discipline being having that freedom to take up any course of their choice in any discipline so let's say if a student studying engineering in iit wants to uh, take up one course in history from a department like whether it is in his institution or anywhere that student should be free to be able to join that class in the current education system you can't do that you will not be allowed to do that so unless you give that freedom of range of learning you can't expect uh, to have uh, the greatest innovators because the innovation comes when you have that freedom of learning and while you are uh, re referring to a possible lack of great innovators unless we adopt the kind of approach that you just elaborated on uh it comes to my mind also that uh, through your presentation we saw the example of a great social scientist in the form of sri dharampal ji who had to go through an immense amount of data uh, that was colonially extracted and archived one has to also have the skill of uh, going through and making sense of the vast amounts of data so that skill uh is not something that would uh, typically be given to a uh, historiographer so uh, i think you would like to talk uh, about that maybe because of your yes. close proximity yes. to sri dharampal ji's work maybe you can uh, show us uh, the kind of training that and also the kind of uh, intellectual and emotional traits that are expected in a student of uh, 21st century who's looking up to creating knowledge creating wonderful research uh doing uh, works on history philosophy basic sciences at the same time so what kind of uh, traits uh you know psychological traits intellectual traits emotional traits uh, would be expected in a 21st century student of such a discipline from your example of sridharam pal ji's work yeah thank you i think dharampal ji was a very interesting example of uh, interdisciplinary study so first of all he was not a trained historian he did not have any degree in history yes and uh, he uh, all these books that he wrote were because of his uh, his his dedication towards conducting scientific inquiry so it was so 
he developed these techniques over time and yes you are absolutely right one requires a huge amount of uh, statistical skills to be able to analyze so much of data in the form of tables and reports and also compile the tables and reports which have so such a vast number of figures you know ranging from different kinds of figures okay so dharampal ji is a very good example of someone who has a mixed uh, uh, skill set they have so he he was also a, a statistician if in one sense one could look at him as a statistician uh, considering the amount of data and reports and tables that he compiled just of st- statistics so uh, the number of castes in a particular school the number of uh, you know uh, d- d- the number of uh, uh, social st- uh, sociological background of the students and all that that is the work of a statistician and one could look at him as a historian considering the amount of historical uh, insights that he had when he looked at these documents so uh, using i mean taking dharampal ji's case for example one could say that when we when we are looking when we are talking about the traits that a student should have um, they should be they should have that openness of thought that their their ideas and their theories are open to uh, are subject to the kind of data they are getting the the problem with a lot of social scientists and especially young researchers is that they often have already decided what they are going to write about before they actually get the data so that shows so the conclusions are fixed in advance so yes to speak. yes yes so uh, dharampal ji did not have that he was open to new data and new ideas and that is why he was able to do what he did also he had that uh, perspicacity he was able to he was so perceptive also that he was able to see through the uh, writings of these surveys so uh, one doesn't have to take everything on face value and one doesn't have to uh, have to, uh, one should have that ability to be able to uh, read against the grain uh, as you say and also the fact that uh, one has to understand the background of the uh, person who is authoring that document because then you can understand that from which standpoint it has been written and you can understand the motivations of that historical document so this requires a training also in psychology in, in some sense because how a colonial official uh, would be thinking or how a british administrator would be thinking how a christian missionary would be thinking how a government official would be thinking because that will will impact their Uh, uh their documents so dharampal ji when he used to produce these documents and used to uh, give out information from them he would be very very selective and he would be very uh, careful in in understanding and analyzing them okay so what to make of these documents how to interpret these documents is also an art and that is also an art of a social scientist so it requires a wide range of skills you need to have that uh uh that hunger for data for that as a for, as a statistician you need to have that patience of a historian you need to have the understanding of a psychologist so you need you you need, need to wear many hats right and uh, uh, because we are approaching the end of our conversation uh yeah, as a summary uh, a particular quote by the contemporary british philosopher gillian rose comes to my mind where she is talking about three uh, aspects that you know typically a student or a scholar of philosophy would have but i would like to maybe extend that to all of uh, humanities and social sciences disciplines and uh, here uh, rose is talking about uh, Uh, intellectual eros and sort of endless curiosity to know about things secondly she is talking about attention the ability to be wrapped by the object that is in front of you without yourself uh, seizing it and uh, finally the third thing that she points out as a sort of very essential trait 
of uh, an ideal student of the humanities um, uh, is uh, acceptance of aporia or pathlessness. This acceptance that there may be no definite solutions to questions, but only the clarification of uh, the statements in the way we pose that problem, in the way we state those problems. So uh, to conclude this, I would like to uh, have your remarks on whether it is possible to sort of assimilate the classical Indian approach and uh, on the other hand, the classical European or the Hellenic approach to knowledge, uh, uh, especially from the point of view of pedagogy, uh, because you have studied uh, education systems uh, from different parts of the world. And uh, you also talked in your presentation about the Chaucer Kalas, uh, the 64 different kinds of arts that one needs to master in order to become, uh, you know, rigorous as, 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 a, as an expert. Uh, and another thing that you have pointed out, which I think is very important in your presentation, is uh, the ability that the ancient Indian uh, gurus and students had to uh, engage in open dialogues. So this openness to knowledge, uh, uh, wherever knowledge and good ideas may come from, let all the uh, doors and windows be open. This is, in fact, what the Vedas say. So do you think that sort of a, a dialogue between the Indic and the Hellenic classical approaches to education is possible? Do you think uh, we can reach an assimilation of these two? So I think that, uh, yes, there is definitely a dialogue possible. And uh, in fact, the classical Hellenistic thought is has many similarities with the classical Indian thought. The one point of convergence, which I think is regarding the nature of studying the self. And this is also something that this is a very important uh, takeaway from the classical systems of learning for both Indian and ancient uh, uh, classical systems is that the observer was never separated from the observed and this is a problem that the current humanities and social sciences disciplines are facing the fact that they talk about the deconstruction of reality of social reality without talking about the deconstruction of themselves I think you talked about uh, the Adhara Shuddhi in this regard, the purification or edification, cultivation, let me say, of the container of knowledge, the subject. Yes. So in Indian knowledge systems, the approach was the reverse. We first began by deconstructing the self. Then we started talking about the social reality. The problem with the current humanities and social science approach is that there is all this talk about deconstruction of the social reality without talking about the deconstruction of the self. And this was a, uh, this is a problem with this current, you know, postmodernist approach. In the classical systems, whether it was classical Indian thought or it was even the classical ancient Greek thought, this was a fundamental feature that the observed was not separated from the observer. So if you had uh, a certain approach in looking at things, it would be included in that study, you know, as they say, the skin in the game, skin in the game. Okay, so skin in the game was uh, recognized in the ancient Indian and uh, in ancient classical Greek thought also. Okay, so this uh, feature of not recognizing the skin in the game is only in the current postmodernist approach. That's why they are not able to come up with any real solution. So uh, this I think is a very important takeaway that knowing the self and knowing the perceiver 
and not separating the perceiver from the perceived not separating the subject from the object is something we should learn from the ancient indian and ancient greek thought also thank you so uh, with that hope of uh, achieving uh, a near future assimilation of the best of the two worlds uh, i think you have uh, uh, reinstated our faith in some ways by uh, your inputs and i would like to thank you for that and especially uh, for coming to our campus and sharing ideas exchanging ideas with us we, i think uh, this is a delight to uh, uh, to speak to you somebody like you who has had uh, training in the humanities but also interestingly i found out that you had your basic training in the undergraduate days uh, as an engineer so maybe with a few personal uh, uh, remarks uh, you know on your uh, own journey of uh, traveling from one discipline to another quite uh, a few different uh, worlds that you have traversed intellectually uh, we can uh, come to the conclusion of this talk thank you uh, yes uh, even my journey has been uh, quite interdisciplinary in many ways uh, the reason i took up engineering was at that time i was very interested in science and fascinated by uh, logic i am still fascinated by logic uh, but i realized that um, my inner quest is to look at the larger historical and intellectual patterns of uh, social and cultural uh, evolution so that's why i took up humanities later on and uh, i didn't want to focus specifically on any technical aspect of the subject so i took up humanities uh, but i retained my uh, logical rigor in any study i was doing so i always used my logical and scientific methods and i never let go of that at the same time i also uh, looked at the whole and larger cultural aspects of things and i realized that in social science it is very difficult to simplify things because social science is the study of society and life in general so it is difficult to come up it is impossible to come up with any universal laws like you can do in science so in fact the questions that social sciences poses are really the hard questions such as the deep origin of societies and this is something which i learned along the way that you can uh, come up with universal laws in science but because it is easy to uh, it is it is comparatively easier to uh, give a structure to that uh, phenomena of nature but you can't do that in social science the functioning of societies is highly complex so i am glad and i am uh, privileged that i had the opportunity to undertake a uh, training in both science and humanities because the scientific training helped me in understanding uh, logic and the use of uh, scientific methods which i also i'm currently using in my research and training in humanities helped me understand the complexity of life and the complexity of social social systems thank you so let us hope that the national education policy and the various uh, public funded as well as private initiatives uh, will uh, uh, help emerge more and more dr kakkas who uh, will not possibly face uh, many challenges as i'm sure you had to in order to juggle between uh, two uh, worlds i myself have had to do a bit of that so let us hope that uh, the unified approach to knowledge especially through liberal arts uh, disciplines and uh, liberal arts education uh, we will have more and more uh, innovators ideators and uh, thought as well as public leaders 
With that hope, I would like to conclude our conversation once again, thanking Dr. Kakkar for this uh, wonderful conversation um, uh, and also his very enlightening lecture presentation. I would also like to thank everybody who has been working uh, very hard on the back end, uh, the entire Marcom team at Rishud University, uh, all the technicians, uh, the uh, people who are managing the auditorium, the camera person, Manjeet ji, there are uh, Ohona, Orgho, uh, Anjuji, everybody else in the Marcom team, also the admin at the Rishud University and everybody uh, at Rashtram School of Public Leadership, Rishud University for making this Center for Civilizational Studies effort uh, uh, possible and possibly a success. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, thank you, Srijit.